I'm really just delighted to be here in Mumbai. I've been in India actually exactly a month. I arrived on the 29th of July in Delhi after a little less than a week in Singapore and I get to stay here for pretty close to a month which was a great um, schedule when I heard about it I was absolutely delighted that I would be here. I know some of you um, are already friends and well acquainted with me because of the YouTube channel that has the, I, I talk more than you have time to listen is <laughs> what people say to me but much more than that what really ties us together is our shared aspiration to live honorably super consciously divinely inspired and that cuts across all categories of nation age culture language absolutely everything I've had the privilege of traveling a great deal to different uh, Ananda worlds and even helping to create an awareness of Ananda in various places around the USA and also on the planet. For the last um, so many years, five or six years since the last time I was in India, there's kind of a time warp on this but it was somewhere in there after Swamiji died. I think I may have come back once or twice but then I took a long hiatus because I had a lifetime assignment to fulfill <coughs> which is this kilo worth of books actually. <laughs> you can also get the Kindle if your back is weak and this is more than you can carry. But this is my, um, well this is really the culmination of my life which is an assignment that Swami Kriyananda gave me the first year that I knew him, which was eventually to write a book about him, which is th the result of this. I know in a few days, which this is the result, the result of this. Um, in a few days I'm going to be doing an official launch, so I won't so much spend time on this now, except I can't help but mention it. Um, it is in a real sense the reason I'm here, because the head of Ananda Publications in India refused to publish it unless I came. <laughs> Which was, in a sense, God's way of telling me what I needed to do next. In the course of writing this book, as I will explain more on a future occasion, I, I went into very serious long seclusion in order to write. I felt that I had, I, it turned out that I, that I had to be away from everything in order to hear Swamiji telling me what the book was supposed to be. And that was the first time in my life that I had months at a time of real seclusion. I'm, I'm a meditator, but I would not have been able to spend that much time in seclusion just meditating. I needed the incentive of this work. And I developed a real taste for it, is the only thing I can say. I discovered that I really, really liked the solitary writer's life, which I had never had a chance to have before. So I was exceedingly reluctant um, to give it up. You know how we are. We just get what we like and we want to keep it. So I had a suspicion I was going to have to give it up, but I held out against that suspicion for a very long time and uh, pretended I didn't know what God wanted me to do, which is a technique that works. <laughs> you, know, you hear his voice very strongly, but you pretend he's not talking to you. <laughs> he's talking to the neighbor, it's quite obvious. <laughs> So it wasn't until Sangeeta told me basically, yeah, she'd be happy to publish it, but only if I came here to carry it around. And of course that was it. Um, some of you do know me, but not all of you. So let me just tell you a little bit about who I am and how I've spent much of my life. I have had the exceedingly good karma to have come onto the spiritual path when I was quite young. I was 18 years old when someone gave me a book by Swami Vivekananda and that would have been whatever 1966 I think yeah 66 probably and I was part of a small coterie of friends who all of us were quite driven to find an alternative way of life I was exactly the right age to be part of the hippie movement in America I was joking on the ride over here that some, uh, some uh, teenagers told me that they studied the hippie movement in their American history class. 
<laughs> so how could you study it? It's not history, it's my life, you know? <laughs> not that I was ever so important as to be in the history books, but it really is a line in the sand, which a few of you in this room understand when your youth becomes a history is quite interesting. <laughs> time is very, time is very fascinating. I have actually, I met Swami Kriyananda in 1969. Ananda celebrated its 50th anniversary and that happens as it turns out to be my 50th year, which even to me sounds like a big number. But you don't do it all at once, you know what I mean? It's not like you're a baby and then bingo, you've lived for 50 years. It passes just a minute at a time. And when you look back and see what you've accumulated, it's, it's, it's a just, it's a very interesting experience. Uh, presuming that I have to incarnate again, which I'm not, I presume that I shall. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I find it more relaxing to presume that I shall. Um, I hope I remember when I'm younger just how fluid time is. Of course, you know, a year is a very high percentage of a child's life, so it looms quite differently. At this point, it's a very low percentage, so it, it just sails by in a moment. But the, there is a reality to having done the same thing for a long time. So I, I met Vivekananda through a book when I was 18. And through him, of course, I grew to love Sri Ramakrishna. And I felt that he was my upaguru. He, he really took me by the hand and held on to me until he could deliver me to what was really my lifelong path. But I've always had this deep devotion. In 1986, when I came to India for the first time, the first time I came to India, I actually led a pilgrimage to India. I led a pilgrimage to a country I'd never been to. <laughs> Fortunately, we had a very you know, experienced Indian guide, but I knew where we were going because by that point I had immersed myself in the lives of the holy people, Ramakrishna, and of course by then I was on this path and this line of masters. But really one of the high points of my life was going to the Kali temple at Dakineshwar and actually sitting in the room where so much of the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna happened. I, I can't, I, I, only those of you who have had such experiences can understand what that meant to me. So I was just, you know, really, relatively speaking, an ordinary American girl, but I think God sent me to that country be, because of this, because of the fact that he has a very different plan for us now. In Autobiography of a Yogi, it says that Master and Jesus Christ together, and I love this, these lines, I'm not going to quote them exactly, are very concerned about what's going on right now. <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't know how that takes place. Are they drinking chai, you know? <laughs> are they chatting like friends? Like, where does that take place? But Jesus Christ and Babaji are very concerned. I lived for a great deal of my life with Swami Kriyananda, who really, after, after his own guru, I believe is one of the most important spiritual figures of our times. Like many such figures, he will be better known in the years to come than he was during his lifetime. The point of mentioning that is, because I lived so closely with him, as did Narayani and Shurjo, um, I understand how you can be spiritually great and still just be a person and have life just go on and actually you drink tea, you have breakfast, you know, you go out for walks, we occasionally go to movies, we go to the mall, you know, just things like that. So even though one can't help but feel this extraordinary reverence when you say Jesus Christ or Babaji, nonetheless, as incarnated beings, they are incarnated beings, and they live among us. So there's also what there's also this possibility of, of intimacy, familiarity, and comfort in their company that allows me to wonder whether they were drinking tea when they were talking about the conditions of this world. Uh, a number of years ago, for for about twenty years. <coughs> 
every year or every other year for a total of about 12 or 13 times. I did lead pilgrimage trips to uh, India, almost entirely Americans, largely disciples of this path, but not always. And we, I became extremely familiar with a very particular route. We traveled for 28 days and would visit the shrines mostly associated with autobiography of a yogi. It was an extraordinary blessing. And uh, when, in the last two years that we did that, uh, we went to Badrinath. We only went twice. I wish we had started going much earlier. And one year that we went to Badrinath, we also met, we, we walked up a little farther, another thousand or two thousand feet up. And we visited a sadhu who lived in a little kutir up there. And he was actually known, maybe he's known now, I don't know. That would have been like 2005 or so, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, he was called Bakswala Baba because during the winter months he would put his body in a metal box so that nothing would eat it and he would essentially vacate his body this is what he said whether this is true or not I don't know but this he sincerely told us all this and uh, then he would spend his time with Babaji in the mountains there so I went, the first time I met him was the first time I was at Badrinath. The first time I was in that kind of a setting, we'd walked up to this little kutir that he's living in. We're looking at a view of the mountains. I mean, in itself, it was thrilling, and it was also extraordinarily evocative for me of, of lives that you can vaguely feel but can't quite remember. And uh, it, it was just magnificent just to sit there. And we sat there in this little place, and he... Actually, he was in silence, so he was writing on a board, and our, he was writing in Hindi, or, or I think it was Hindi. How would I know? But anyway, he was writing a language I couldn't even tell the script, and our guide was translating. So after this is all done, and we had this wonderful experience later, I'm back in Delhi, and Swami Kriyananda had his house in Gorgaon at that time, and we're talking. And he asked me what I thought of this man, because it was the first Ananda was just meeting him. And I have no idea what's become of him or anything. <coughs> Swami asked me what I thought, you know, what was my impression of him. I told Swamiji it was extremely hard to sort it out because I'd been to the Badrinath temple for the first time. I was sitting in this kutir, maybe my own kutir from some past life. I'm staring out the window at the high Himalayas and he's writing on a slate board in a language I can't read. There was just a lot going on and I was, I was, so uh, elevated in my consciousness, I didn't know where it was coming from. And then I said to him, Sir, but he talks so casually about putting his body in the box for the winter and then going up and spending all his time with Babaji. And, it, and so that to me was like a question mark. He talks so casually about these things. So his answer was brilliant, as his answers always were. Oh, he said, at a certain point it's just natural. Yes, and in fact, at a certain point, it is just natural because that's just who you are and that's what you would do. To me, it seemed exceedingly exotic. But to him, if it was him, it was just natural. This is what I do in the winter. Some people go to Goa, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, why not? <laughs> so in, in all that context, I going back to when I was 18, I became completely, well, uh, Ramakrishna just lived in my heart and he really took care of me. St. Francis I also came to know and he really took care of me. And I had all this passion for self-transformation and just this passion to do something meaningful with my life and I just, I couldn't make it happen. I, I just didn't know how to make it happen. You know, in, in uh, California, I happen to be—I happen to be living in Palo Alto, California, which is exactly where I still live. It's like I had some destiny with that geography, and I just would go to work, and I would come home, and I would go to work, and I would come home, and I couldn't—I couldn't break the pattern in any way at all. And then Swami Kriyananda <clears throat> was invited to give a speech at Stanford University, which is right there in Palo Alto, which is. Stanford is across the street from the Ananda Temple now, the far corner 
of the vast amount of land that Stanford's owns, not the not the really the heart of the campus. But Swami was invited to speak there because it was the 60s and a fraternity there thought it would be a lark to have a Swami come and speak. It was a bit of a chaotic night. And by then I, thank you, that's more helpful. By then I had uh, met a friend who had become devoted to Swami. So I went to hear him speak. <clears throat> he was the first living example of self-realization. He was the first person whose consciousness was not anything like anything I'd ever seen. And I knew about it in theory, so I was prepared for it. A friend of mine had recommended, her, her words were, he's a real teacher, which is a very beautiful phrase, which I've always loved. He's a real teacher, she said. I think you'll like him. You know, she's still my, one of my dearest friends, and it's a bond that I mean, nothing could break it. You know, when a person is responsible for as much as she was responsible for in my life, friends forever. BFF doesn't begin to describe <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> but in any case, he came into the room and, you know, I was, I was a serious truth seeker, but I was an airhead. I really didn't know what. I was saying, sure Joe warned, warned me that not all slang translates. Does airhead translate? It means inside my head there was nothing but air. Is that obvious? <laughs> you know? But uh, I just could tell that he was something else. And what he was was what I had been waiting my whole life to see. And it was personal. It had to have been. I mean, personal in the sense of a past life. You don't, you don't have such a feeling of recognition that turns out not to be impulsive. You would think it was impulsive, but 50 years later, apparently, it was more serious than that. But the experience was just so total, and it came out of really nowhere. It was, in retrospect, one can see how everything, even from my earliest childhood, was leading me there. One of my earliest memories, I love I love reincarnation. You know, I just love, I love it. I love little examples of it. My, my, I have an older brother, I have a younger sister, but I don't think she was born yet. My older brother, um, he's a great guy, and, but you know, he was my older brother. I don't know if any of you are or had one, but older brothers and younger sisters have a certain dynamic, which is they can always make it seem like it's your fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he and I were in the back seat of the car and he made it seem like it was my fault. I was very small, like two maybe, because I was small enough to curl up on the floor of the car quite comfortably. No seat belts in those days. Um, he made it seem like it was my fault, and my mother turned around from the front seat and scolded. I felt me, and probably I felt undeservedly. And my feelings were hurt. I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are. You, you know, your heart hurts. And I remember that I didn't like that feeling of my feelings being hurt, and I didn't like feeling them my mother was wonderful, so it wasn't like I was, had a reason to be upset. But I didn't like the way I felt, and I curled up on the floor of the car. We were, we were driving, and I put my head down so that I could hear the wheels, you know, ohm, 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 ohm. And I remember thinking, I have a place inside that I can go to where nothing, where nothing unhappy can touch me. And I remember just curling up on the floor and going there. And I, I knew that if I kept concentrating and listening to that sound, I could go to the place where I would always be happy. Isn't that interesting? Like, how, where does such a thought come into a two-year-old's mind? My parents were intelligent and moral and wonderful, but they never said anything like that to me. I just knew. And, 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 Swami Kriyananda walks in the room and, my gosh, he lives there. You know, he lives there. He knows how to get there. By then I'd read the books, I knew it was an option, but he lives there and I just decided wherever he was, I would be. You know, karma being what it was, it took me from November 69 till June 1st of, of uh, 71 to extricate myself and actually put myself where he was, which I never moved from after that. He moved me a couple of times, <laughs> you know, so that uh, after 16 years, 
of living where he did and in very close association he he had me go down to Palo Alto where I where I've been for the last 30 years this being about four hours from the first community but by then Swami was going to Europe and then eventually came to India so it's been like this but all through it I've never done I mean it, I was 22 when I met Swami I was 23 when I 24 when I cast my lot in full time with this uh, a number of years ago the last time I was in India probably I was in Bangalore and I gave a satsang at somebody's house there. And they were, you know, they didn't know me at all. The, the YouTube channel, I think, wasn't as active then. So they didn't know me at all. So I was telling this story. And I was talking about how I just cast everything aside and moved to Ananda village, which then was a very remote country location. There was no sign anywhere that it would ever be anything except absolutely dirt poor impoverished living in this kind of lunatic fringe kind of life but I just picked up and went and uh, the people in the room said the natural question what did your parents think <laughs> <laughs> well first I had to say I'm an American <laughs> the second thing I had to say I was born an American because I would have been a terrible daughter in India and an unthinkable daughter-in-law. There's just not a chance because I am extremely rebellious and independent. So starting with that. But my answer was, I never thought to ask them. And I also thought, what did it matter to me what they thought? Now don't take that in the wrong way because my parents were lovely and I deeply, I'm deeply grateful to them. But in Autobiography of a Yogi, there's this instance where Sri Yukteswar, um, excuse me, where Master's father, who is a devoted disciple of Lahiri Mahashaya, and in fact supported Master financially in America for many years, where he says, he starts to say something derogatory about Sri Yukteswar, Master's guru. And Master says to his father, Human birth is something, but divine birth is everything. If you say one more word against my guru, I disown you as my father forever. <gasps> oh my gosh. You know, I mean, like, what an example. And, and yet, you, you see in autobiography how, how much he honored his father, how much he loved his mother how attentive he was. I mean, there's all these stories about his relationships to his siblings. But when it came to devotion to God, it's an all or nothing proposition. You just don't, you don't, um, let me think what I want to say. You don't give up. Now, he was also very attentive to his parents and attentive to his siblings and respectful because the single question is sort of funny. It's like in America, I get the same question in a lot of, uh, people ask the same question in many forms. And the question is, because it's a very American question, isn't there a faster, better way to get to God realization? <laughs> isn't there a trick or a shortcut? That's the question. And that question gets asked in ways that doesn't sound like that question. It sounds like a considered, you know, concern with these principles or that option, you know, like this. But when you parse it apart, that's the question. In India, the question is, my mother, my father, my kids, my grandparents, <laughs> my job. You know, how am I also, where does God, you know, where does he fit in all of that? But of course, we're all born where we're supposed to be born. When I first became acquainted, because I didn't travel until I was, until I left, until let's see, it would have been 1982, and I came to Europe, I went to Europe with Swamiji. So I was like in my mid-30s before I left America, so like many Americans I was a bit insular but as I came to know the Indian family system and so on I knew I had been born in America because I didn't you know I didn't think I could really feel it fit into it however everybody has karma 
you know, and everybody thinks that somebody else's karma would be easier than mine. <laughs> you know, I'm a sannyasi, I've been a sannyasi now for 10 years, ever since Swamiji made this possible. I point to my blue clothes, that's, it's really, I should point somewhere else, but, you know, because it's more than what I wear, but the, it's a symbol of it. I am a sannyasi, so people with families think it would be easier to be a sannyasi, because you're not. <laughs> And that's sort of just what it is. But he, he doesn't make errors, meaning God and Guru, they don't, mistake, don't make mistakes. They're not going to look and say, oh, you, oh my gosh, you've got all that family. No, you were meant to be somewhere else. Let me put you over here. It, it doesn't happen like that. We, we are drawn exactly to what we need. You know? And so when I was 22, I met Swami Kriyananda. And after that, I went to live with him. And I've had as much karma as everyone else. It just looks different. You know, I, I, have, I think there's a certain quota of misery and struggle that every human being has to go through. Because if we don't, we just never learn anything. But, but the ego, ah, uh, the ego. The ego loves pleasure and the ease. That's the ego's great, you know, that's the definition of good. It's very interesting when you hear yourself or other people talk about good and bad karma, which we like to talk about. Good karma is pleasurable and easy. Bad karma is challenging and difficult, right? But pleasurable and easy often means, oh goody, I get to learn nothing this incarnation. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and like, is that actually good? Like, by what standard is that good? Oh, or in this incarnation, I get to strip away everything that doesn't look like a saint, even the parts of it that I'm clinging to as mightily and as strongly as I really can. So the whole process of the spiritual path is, it's just very interesting. I, because um, I had a lot of energy, have, I still do, thank you God, I have a body that works well and I have a lot of energy and always have, I, I moved fast and I have a quick mind. So from you know, from my childhood, I kind of, I'm a quick study. I kind of saw things and did them. I, I really learned nothing in my childhood, but I, I did a lot of what I would later call neti neti. I found out a lot of what I didn't want. So even when I came to be with Swamiji, um, I hoped that this was going to hold me for longer than a short time. But I wasn't capable of really um, I'm looking into the future. I'm not a prophet. But I hoped it would hold me because many things had already come and gone. Being a hippie didn't last very long, as an example. It just, these things just didn't really work for me. But I hoped that, that Swamiji would hold me forever. And what happened was exactly that. Um, when I, I grew up in Texas, El Paso, Texas, I was not quite out of high school when my parents moved to California. And El Paso, you don't know the geography, but it's a big desert area. It's the kind of desert area where it's just sand in all directions and hills of sand and not even a lot of cactus, just mostly sand. And to get from El Paso to anywhere else, you would have to drive a, a couple of hours across this desert. And so as children, my parents had little vacation spots. They'd take us to the mountains or the this or the that. And uh, we'd just drive on these featureless flat roads for really long periods of time. You know, now as an adult, you think, how do your parents stand it? You know, you're, I'm bouncing on the back, pulling on my dad's hair, leaning over, you know, he's trying to drive. And, and because of the landscape, there was that kind of a mirage where it looks like it's water. And my father was, was fun. And so I would, we would play this game where he would try to catch up to the water, <laughs> you know? And we would, the whole, the, uh, my sister was probably in the picture by then. You know, we'd have this whole game where we'd urge him on and he'd try to catch the water and we would be almost sure we'd catch it this time and then we wouldn't. And, but it just would always recede because it was of course a mirage. Well, I began, because that was so vivid in my childhood, I, when I began to, uh, uh, be, let's see, I say when I began to understand Swami, which might be tomorrow, 
when I began to realize what I really had in him and what I really had in this line of masters and in Kriya Yoga and the path and the spiritual family and the whole incredible magnificent story it's been my life ever since he, I really saw I remember that mirage and so every time I would even imagine there was an edge you know that I could catch okay done with that learned it it would just move out in front of me and of course it will continue because where we're going is infinite and by definition, it's all pervasive. It's the, it, you can't catch it. You, you, you become it, actually. But so I've just always seen, no matter what I think I know or I understand, it just keeps getting bigger. I saw a few of you yesterday, and I told this story then, so forgive me and all, but I, I wanted to say it now because it's very relevant. You know, when you first start on the spiritual path, which maybe tomorrow for me but you know when because it's well I'll, I'll skip back to something else for a moment when Swami Kriyananda wrote his autobiography which he later titled The New Path but the original version was simply called The Path he didn't call it new because he revised it he just decided that was a better name because he felt like Master's Path was a new path um, so he, he wrote that book from 1974 to 1976. And those were the years, a, a, a lot of these stories are in the book, but because the book is a chronological story from 1969 until 2013. Every chapter of the book is a year. If Swami had lived longer, it would have been heavier, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, uh, so we would have had to put on wheels or something for you to carry it. But in any case, um, uh, I was working with him as his secretary, which I, the modern phrase these days is personal assistant, but you know, we didn't have that phrase. So I was just called his secretary, but it, it, I just helped him with his life. And I, I wasn't the only one who did. He managed to keep actually, like, ex he kept about 150 of us really busy actually, but because he was so creative. But I worked personally with him, and that was the last book he wrote before he got a computer. So it was typed on an electric typewriter, and uh, Swami edited, edited just uh, extremely conscientiously. And so he would type, and then he would put the paper on a clipboard, and then he would move from the desk to a chair, and he would edit with the pencil. And then he would retype. And his, the way his mind worked, he could never be sure a page was finished until there were, no, there were no marks on it. So that meant typing, retyping, typing, retyping. At, at first, I mean, after a while, because I was just, you know, I didn't, I was, I had, let me see how to say this. I had to persuade him that I could retype because he also would edit while he typed and he didn't want to give that up, but we finally agreed that it was, uh, probably a gain if I typed it for him. So I, I typed and retyped that manuscript over and over and over again. And then finally he had finished essentially the first draft. Now let me think, oh yes, this is all for such a small story that the comment here is so tiny. Okay, <laughs> when I finally get to it. He went to Hawaii to um, work on the book, to edit it. And uh, this other woman and I, Kalyani and I, went with him to cook for him and and basically to drag him out of the house every once in a while just so that he wouldn't go absolutely berserk just working on this book. But at one point we absolutely needed a holiday. So we were gonna go on a boat ride. And so we're on this boat ride. We're, I have to call up to get tickets. And he says to me, how many adults, how many children? And really I was gonna say one adult, two children. You know? <laughs> I was 30 which is relatively young, but I really thought if I showed up on a half price ticket, they wouldn't take it, you know? But I, I had to like cross my fingers because I was telling a lie, three adults, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just for the purposes of your tickets, it's three adults, but in terms of life, it was one adult and two children. That was just absolutely no way about it. To the end of my life, you know, I always called him sir. And I just felt like, you know, there's one adult on the planet as far as I know, and now he's gone. And the rest of us are just doing what we can to try to catch that mirage. So 
where I am coming back to is, you know, it's, this is the 50-year issue. It's like, at a certain point, it just becomes natural because it's just who we are. And this is what we're all working with on the spiritual path. I had this particular karma. Everybody has different karma. I had this karma to start young. I had this karma to not quit. I mean, that's how do you get to 50 years? You just don't stop. You don't die and you don't quit. You know, that's what happens. And success on the spiritual path, far more than most people realize, is not to quit. You know, we have this sort of idea at the beginning. Uh, I was so intellectual when I started uh, on the path. Swami really had to <clears throat> work hard on me is the only thing where I can put it, you know. It, there was a lot that had to be cut away that didn't look like a saint. Let's just put it like that. Maybe we'll just leave it there. I'm always torn between telling you the full truth and just wanting to spare you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, it, I was, I just had so many ideas that were just ideas about things. And because of the way I was raised and the way my, way my DNA is made, I like ideas. <laughs> and Swamiji was so intelligent. I mean, it wasn't, his intelligence was not the reason that we loved him so much. You know, it was his heart was the reason we loved him so much. But his intelligence certainly made him fun, especially for a pe person like me who liked the same thing. It was like our hobby. Our hobby was like to be intelligent. That's about how important it was, you know? <laughs> but we both liked it. And I mean, and Ananda actually generally, and it's all true in this room, and it's been true in the whole month I've been in India, you know, you don't come to the path of self-realization unless you've done a certain amount in your life that enables you to perceive that there is an alternative to the material world and to the this, the, I, I don't want to be rude, but to the more surface kind of spirituality. There, there comes a point where, you, where one realizes that I, I really, this is, I want this to be me. I don't want this just to be something that is outside myself. Because one, especially in, in this country where, you know, spirituality is still very vibrant, I, I, I've been told that on September 12th, which is the anniversary of the day Swami met Master, we're going to have a program here, if we're lucky, because a half a block away is the Pandal or whatever they're building in that we understand there will be a lot of competition on that <laughs> night. I don't, even, I don't even mean attendance, I just mean joyful celebration that will <laughs> fill the room. But uh, it's, one can participate in the spiritual life in this country. America is becoming extremely secular. But nonetheless, there's something much deeper. There's something much deeper that is, has nothing to do with what we look like on the outside. It only has to do with this uh, compelling desire to change. Um, I, I attended college for, for one year. I actually attended college for about two weeks, but I actually finished the whole year before I, I, I decided never to go back. I, I went to Stanford, which always gives me a little bit of prestige, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, a, a, a normal person could get into Stanford 50 years ago. Now you have, I don't know who you have to be to get into Stanford. You have to have Jesus Christ as your father or the one who writes that recommendation. But in any case, and I, I kind of, the way I want to say it is I kind of held on once I saw I was going there because I thought this is a great university. Somebody's actually going to know something of what I wanted to know, which is the meaning of life and how to have a meaningful existence, how to have joy, how to genuinely help others, you know, just the things, the common, ordinary things that you would think everybody would want. And so I got there, and they were very intelligent, and they were very knowledgeable, but they were not wise. And so it took me about two weeks to realize, oh my gosh, you know, what now? It was about 
It's about 10 months later that I was handed the book by Vivekananda, so I didn't have to really suffer all that long, but it was pretty intense while it went on. Um, now let me think what I was going to say about that. Oh, I was talking about Swami being intelligent. Just give me a minute, I'm sure I can figure it out. Oh, I had lots of ideas. So somewhere in there, uh, after I met Swamiji, before I met Swamiji, I had Autobiography of a Yogi, um, among the many other books that I had. But I was sort of brought up on Vivekananda, who was a bit more you know, intellectual and Vedantic in his way. And here's Master's all, f you know, he's all in love with Divine Mother, and, and Lahiri Mahashaya materializes in a wheat field. I believe it's page nine. It's very early in the book, which I was so austere. I thought it was just way too much phenomenon for me. <laughs> I just closed the book like this. But it's interesting how vibrations work. Uh, when, I, the, when I heard Swamiji speak for the first time, uh, I remember him, I, I, in my mind, I see him walking in the door. I, can, I know what he looked like, I know where he was standing, I know everything about when I first saw him. He then spoke for maybe an hour, I have no idea what he said. I can't, I just remember absolutely nothing. I do remember thinking, oh, he's so intelligent. And I thought, oh, that's so fun. You know, I was just like so happy. Because I already knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him, and now I could see it was going to be fun. <laughs> but uh, I did figure out somewhere in there that he was a disciple of Yogananda. And maybe my friend told me, I don't really know. Um, so I went back to my bookshelf, and I opened Autobiography of a Yogi. I loved it. <laughs> you know, what changed? What changes is that there's this, this, this long vibrational link. And, and we think we're doing this with our minds. We're not at all doing it with our minds. We're, we're actually doing it with, from our superconsciousness, from our soul. I know that Narayani and Shurjo have made great use of Swami's vow of superconscious living, which I really think is a, is a wonderful um, center point for what we're doing because the superconscious is so much wiser than the rest of us. It keeps the heart in line and it puts the mind in its proper place. Um, but there's this, um, this uh, flow, let me just say, the, the thought just eluded me one more time. No, we will find it. Oh yes. So when I, I finally, oh I was talking about the vibrational flow. It's like the mind catches up afterwards and it finds reasons, and, and it should. Having a clear mind is exceedingly helpful on the spiritual path. And quite apart from Swami's intelligence, it wasn't really his intelligence I began to figure out, it was his clarity. Swami just could, in every situation, he could figure it out. You know, there'd be, we were a bright bunch. You know, we were mostly in our 20s that first year because those early years, because we needed youth in order to launch the movement. We needed youth, we needed people who were unencumbered, we needed people who were just a little crazy, you know, who could just jump into this thing that Swamiji could see, but to the rest of us it was just huts in the wilderness, you know, it, it wasn't really anything. He could see it, but, so we were actually a very bright bunch. The people who who dropped out of society at that time were a particular tribe, and they were very interesting. And, um, but Swamiji, he could just put us in the shade. You know, we would be working so hard to figure out things. We'd bring an issue to him, and he, he would just, he would give solutions, answers, insights that were just so obvious when he said them that you just couldn't figure out why you hadn't seen it. So at first I thought he was intelligent, and I've used that word about 10 or 15 times in the last couple of minutes. But I actually began to wonder what it was that made him so, so insightful is the right word for it. And I, I finally actually figured it out. It wasn't his mind actually that was so powerful and clear, it was his heart. And, and those of you who did meet Swami saw him at the end of his life. And he was, he was a little shrunken, his, you know, his, he, he, worked, he worked out a lot of people's karma on that body. 
And so that body really got used. It's an amazing, it's only because Shurjo and Narayani basically held him up, and Narayani alone, and then Shurjo, that he lived as long as he did, literally. But when I knew him, he was, I met him when he was 44. He was very strong and really physically strong and powerful. And his posture was, his spine was absolutely straight. And, and he had that kind of chest that yogis get. So that when you looked at him, like from the side, he wasn't heavy. Different lights, different times in his life, he was heavier and thinner. But the, the plane of his body was the heart like the first thing that came. And I still have to work with this. My posture was I leaned in with the frontal lobe, you know, <laughs> even the left side of the frontal lobe, you know. That's how I pushed against life, like this. So I met at heart first. I mean, even just, you know, the way he would stand, it would be like completely unprotected, here I am. That's all, just like this. One of the lines in one of the songs he wrote, Give life your heart, bless everything that's grown, fear not the loving, all this world's your own. And that was his motto. And so as a consequence, nothing inhibited a clear perception of reality. Master says, reason follows feeling. If our emotions are involved and prejudiced, our mind will make up reasons why it's true. We all know this. You know, and there's a, when it gets really big, it's called denial. You know, it's really big. And Swamiji was not afraid of anything. So he could just look at a situation and whatever it was, he would see it. Whereas I and some of my compatriots, <coughs> we had a whole lot of categories of things that could or couldn't happen. And most of them were subconscious, just prejudices, starting with culture and gender and upbringing and just narrow like this. We all know what that's like. And so Ami didn't have that. And so I, I just began to realize, you know, just how different. Um, I, I spoke at the beginning about Jesus and Babaji drinking tea while they discussed the condition of the world. Swamiji was absolutely natural. Even, I mean, at the very end of his life, um, it was a little different, and also he, he, he allowed himself to be recognized at the end of his life for, you know, 35 or 30 of the 45 years I knew him. He didn't. He just was so natural that you had to, you had to have intuition to realize what you were dealing with. But he was just so free. And, and so what I was starting to say, I was talking about ideas. Somewhere in there when I started reading Master's writing, he spoke of the fact that within each of us we have a portable paradise. And I don't know why, but I love that phrase, portable paradise. I would contemplate it, it was so marvelous. And for some reason, from the time I read that phrase, I thought it would take me five years. <laughs> I have no idea where that number came from. But I just had this thought in my mind that it, in five years pretty much it would be done. This is what I mean about I just had ideas. And then I would defend them. Like, you know, like what? And because I was intelligent, I could defend them intelligently. <laughs> Didn't make them any less foolish. It just meant because I was afraid. I was afraid of a lot. And I, you know, I had so many fears I didn't even know I had them. Because that's the way we are. We're afraid of whatever, it might be true. We're afraid of the fact that we are essentially alone in this world. Here's, here's a remarkable statement that Swamiji made that I only offer for your consideration because it still just fascinates me. He said, at the moment of, of final liberation when moksha comes. And he, well, he, he never said anything he didn't know. Let me just put it that way. The moment of moksha, he said, when you realize that you are one with everything and that there is only one reality, 
I was raised Jewish. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it didn't mean there's only one God, it meant that God is one. So Swami says, at the moment of moksha, when you realize that there is only one reality, he said, for just a moment you feel intensely lonely. Isn't that a remarkable statement? And then he said, that feeling is washed away by bliss. But when we think of all our fears, you know, that what that statement of Swami's has meant to me, I've understood, is that we're, we're always afraid that we really are alone. You know, it just whatever, how, if, you, if you really, if we really have the courage to really go deep into it, which you can either volunteer to go deep into it, or God will drag you into it. You really have a choice. We, we, we are going to move forward, and we can move forward because, oh, it's such a beautiful vision, I want to run into it. Or we can stand here until the fire gets really hot behind us. <laughs> you know. But one way or another, we're going to move. Right? I mean, sometimes we just stand there and let ourselves be burned to a crisp, and then we just start over. But one way or another, we're going to move. Because eventually, the way we're made is that we have to find the truth. We just have to find it. And there is this, I mean, this is, what, this is why we're so busy for so many lifetimes. We're trying to find a way, and we're trying to find an alternative. If I just had enough money, if I just get the right spouse, if I'm just beautiful enough, if I'm smart enough, if, you know, whatever it might be, then I actually won't be alone. It, I say, no, 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 not me. I'm not alone. It's fine. I'm protected. I will never, I know, I'm fine. I'm fine. You can tell I'm fine, right? Like this. <laughs> Master said, the reason we incarnate, reincarnate repeatedly, is not because it's a total catastrophe. Because if it was a total catastrophe, we would say, enough already. It's because he said, it almost works. You know, it's just like, it was almost fine, but you know, my, my son was a lemon. I just need, is that a phrase you know? Lemon means he was, he was a flawed one, you know? <laughs> I had high hopes for him, but he, he didn't agree with me. The only problem was I didn't enjoy being an engineer, and next time I'll be a banker. You know, everything was great except the climate was too hot. It just, whatever. So we just, we just amend it just a little. You know, and we, we plan it all out, and bingo, here we are again. And it almost worked this time, too. There was just one other little problem. And the Master said, that's why we keep doing it over and over again, until finally it begins to dawn on us that there's something essentially wrong here. But then the courage to really just accept whatever is, and then realize that we have to love it anyway. You know, it's easy to be cynical. Cynical is no problem. Being closed is no problem. Being, you know, what I call the preemptive strike. You know, they're no good anyway, so I'll just attack them before they attack me. You know, that's a good one, but none of it works. Because in the end, we are alone before God. And we are alone with our own consciousness. And then at some point, we have to really start working on that consciousness. Someone asked me in one of the places I was before I got here, in India, I get really interesting questions, I and mean, I'm going to give you a chance in a moment to ask some, if you like. A woman asked me, uh, let's see, because in that context I had already spoken a great deal about, much more than I have tonight, about what life was like with Swami and a thousand things about that that are all in this book. She asked me, Oh, she said, what part of who you are is because of Swami and what part uh, is you? Well, I, I had things to say like, the parts you don't like, that's me, you know? <laughs> it's a very paradoxical because people say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful. And you say, this is what you like. <laughs> you know, the part you don't like is what's left. And it's true. I mean, he was the same. People would just lavish praise upon Swamiji and he would just say, it's just master. And that it was the truth. You know, we are all 
what's beautiful about us is where we aren't. <laughs> it's a paradox, because then people really want to praise you, and you know that what they're praising is what isn't. Um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was asked by a journalist once in this sort of obsequious manner. And well, I don't know what the journalist expected the answer to be, but the question was, uh, people say you're a saint, what do you think about that? <laughs> and I expect, I think they expected to say, oh no, not me, <laughs> you know, just like that. And the way he asked it, that was sort of like it. She just, uh, I met the woman a number of times because on our pilgrimages we would meet her in Calcutta. She just looked right at him and, why aren't you a saint? <laughs> Which was, well, that's a good question, isn't it? She, because she knew that she was an instrument of Jesus. And, and she, you know, she was, why aren't you dedicated to Jesus like I am? Why aren't you letting him work through you like I am? Like, what's your excuse? It was, you know, it was just such a perfect, you know, twist on that. So now I had the thought and I will, oh yes, so the woman asked me, what part did I bring? And so I, I tried to give her the usual answer, which is, you know, I don't know, I owe everything to Swamiji. I would just, my life would be, well, I don't even like to think about it. It would have been a catastrophe. So what can I, how can I separate it? And I don't mean that I have no ego, don't misunderstand me, but I can't separate it. But she was insisting, as people do, you know, when you try to not have ego, they want to make sure that you have some. <laughs> you know, so she kept trying to make sure that I had some. So I tried to think, actually, what is the answer to that question? I, you know, I had certain natural abilities. Everybody does. But I actually found something I could say. I said, I'm a truth seeker. I'm a real serious truth seeker. And I have been from a very young age. Just like I, I really... I really wanted, <clears throat> I never liked it when people gave me false arguments. I never liked it when they covered up the truth with some kind of thing that was supposed to make them look better. I just, I wasn't good at that, which is why I was so rebellious. You know, just, I was not good at that. I was a very serious truth seeker, and I'll take the hard truth. I might not take it the first time it's offered me, <laughs> or the second, or the third, but sooner or later, I'll do it, you know, and that's, that's basically what, what we're here to do. So Amiji was fearless in that. Oh, I, I, let me tie up one more loose end before I ask for questions. So when I began to see how Swami was, and I began to emulate him, because why not? You know, I modeled myself basically on his way of being, because he certainly looked like he had, a, had it, he was behaving better than anybody else I knew. I don't mean that I looked like him or dressed like him or adopted his accent, but I tried to be like he was. So you, you study the yamas and the niyamas and you begin to try to be like that. So I was the story I was telling yesterday, I was 22, Swami was 44 when I first met him, and so he remained 22 years older than me all the way through. And as time passed, I got to be 44. <laughs> And by the time I was 44, I was working with people who were 20 years younger than me because by then I had responsibilities and we were, I was attracting a different generation. All the time I was, I say, growing up with Swami. I often say, I grew up at Ananda village. People try to do the math and they can't make that work. But I was a child in every possible way when I started. And I'm not. Well, I said I'm not, I'm not actually a grown up. I'm not there yet, but I'm not as much of a child. I'm at least a precocious adolescent about now. <laughs> but all the time that I was going through my 20s and my 30s and working and living with Swami, I've had, I have an absurd confidence in my own point of view, to a fault. It's a good quality, but I carry it a little far. And, you know, Swamiji just always treated me like I had something to say. And you know, occasionally I did, and lots of times I didn't, but I would still say it, that didn't stop me, and I would still assert it and struggle with it. And So here I am dealing with people who are much younger than me, who have very little experience, but are very bright and capable people. And the, you know, there's a temptation to get your way by asserting age and experience or authority. And 
since I'd always tried to emulate Swamiji, it was, I, I really clearly realized in a way I hadn't thought about that much. I tried to think, and I have a very good memory, especially for him. I couldn't think of a single instance in which he referred to my age or my lack of experience. Everything that I presented he took on, it, on its own terms, and if it wasn't sensible we'd work through it. But we'd work through it. He would never just cut me off because I was <laughs> young and incompetent, good grief. But So I wanted to treat others that way, of course. Sometimes it took a little bit of discipline to put up with it, you know, with people behaving toward me exactly as I had behaved, but it seemed karmically appropriate. So when I saw Swamiji after that realization came to me, I said to him, I just want to thank you for never in all those years referring to my age. And he, he accepted it graciously, but I could tell that there was an unresolved reality here. There was something I wasn't getting. I could feel that. And then he added, I never noticed your age, he said. He said, I never noticed the age of people. He says, even children. He said, we're all souls. You know, a child can be a God-realized master. And somebody who's 80 can be completely egoic bound. It has nothing to do with your body. He described it once as the most trivial consideration, is the age of your body. I never noticed, he said. So I took that home and thought about it, and I realized this goes way back to the beginning of when I started talking. I try to behave properly. Swamiji has changed his consciousness. And so, for him, it's perception. For me, it's discipline. And of course, discipline brings a change in perception. But my, my, isn't that different? This, at a certain point, it becomes natural. And you know, whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, that's what we're working for. So that, at a certain point, it becomes natural. And people compliment you and you think, for what? You know, this is the way, this is just the way it is. Not even the way I am. This is just the way it is. And this is the door that this path opens. And all you have to do, well, dying is fine because you'll just keep going. <laughs> to, have, to have it work for you is just to persevere and not quit. That's all there is. And my whole, after all these years, actually, don't quit. That's basically my whole story at this point doesn't matter whether you're good, bad, or superb. Just don't quit. And have the courage. Have the courage of the heart. You know? All right.